Guys, the first Doom came out when I was six years old in 1993. The franchise is almost 30 years old. So I'm excited to check out Maxor's latest review, sort of Doom Eternal. Let's get into it. I swear to God, if you throw me into that portal, I will fuck you. You were never one of us. You were nothing but an imposter. Whoa. Oh, damn. Is this the Batman Begins dark reboot of Among Us? I'm digging it already. Guys, the one thing that you gotta love about Doom is that it doesn't try to take itself too seriously. Even in 93, you've gotta remember, this was right after the Satanic Panic, when Americans legitimately believed, a large portion of them, like something like 40%, really were convinced that Satan and demons like actually roamed the earth and would physically persuade people to do bad things. Now, this was e also the era when the evils of hair metal, that's right, the evils of hair metal, were creating another moral panic on the belief that they secretly, subliminally influenced kids to engage in Satanism, because if you played the records backwards, they had evil messages. This is true, there were congressional hearings about it, and Al Gore's wife was leading the charge to stop metal hair bands from putting secret satanic messages in their music oh boy so you can imagine when a game literally dedicated in which you the hero just shot demons in the face you can imagine how that landed in the american consciousness i think it is a brilliant little bit of trolling but it also became one of the most popular games of all time and initiated a new panic in which moralizing crusaders decided that violent video games were going to cause an epidemic of interpersonal violence in the United States among children. Doom Eternal is a game with so much testosterone dripping from its orifices that it caused me to create a sun via mitosis. In this adventure, you play as John Doom, a man stricken with irrationally severe Okay, I, I, is this true? Is this just a Maxor thing where every person is John, the name of the game? Fear ought. John Among Us is the crew in the space station. Who does not consider or think through his actions and effects on other people. And in his quest to save mankind, kills God, God God, and Satan God God, who is also himself. If this in-depth and engaging hardcore male gameplay sounds appealing, then I've got the game for you. This game is of course the sequel to the critically acclaimed Doom 2016 with a few key differences. Okay, I love the person I love the fact that they threw in, let's back it up just a little bit. They love the fact that there he is. There he is, blowing the doom horn. Right? That's a that's a meme right there. You guys know what I'm talking about? He also reminds me of the caffeine meme, another one close to my heart, which in which a skeleton with glowing red eyes is sitting in their chair looking shocked. I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna it's gonna be right here. It just reminds us that caffeine can do a lot of things. But it can't do everything. All right then, buddy. I'm going to shit yourself. Yep, I'm going to say that I suspect that Doom back then was also sort of a tongue-in-cheek parody of Moral Panic. And I suspect that Doom today is probably another tongue-in-cheek parody of over-the-top Call of Duty heroes, as we've seen, who somehow survive helicopter crashes with no helmet and can take round after round in the face, right? Doom just does away with the pretense and says, great, let's take this parody of a person who has no plan, no forethought, and just wanders through life shooting things, which frankly is exactly what Call of Duty is. Doom just maybe doesn't pretend which meaningfully extends and builds off of the gameplay and challenges that we love, then extends them some more off of a fucking cliff until the product that emerges out the other side resembles crack concentrate. If you're watching this, I'm assuming you've probably played the game since I don't actually want to help people buy things. I'm here to entertain people, and if you're clamoring for entertainment and haven't purchased this game yet, do yourself a favor. There's enough male hormones here to transition someone, and I can guarantee you results, my fellow Sigma males. So <laughs> Sigma male nation presents 
Oh my god. God God bless God bless the Sigma males, man. Making sure there's some women left for the rest of us. Whether you're a psychopath like me or new to modern Doom games, come with me on this amazing journey through Twitch gameplay, beautiful environments, nonsensically fucked up lore, and remixed Mongolian throat singing. For money is temporary, but Doom is eternal. Mm. Yeah. I would say that Doom Eternal's gameplay is quite unique and not for the reasons that you would think. Everything in Doom Eternal is funneled directly into a single, robust, multifaceted, multinational, and unilaterally combat system from which the entire game is a multinational combat system. I guess if you're doing combat in different countries, then it makes sense. Built around. But Maxor, I hear you thinking, that's every game ever. Yes every good game ever. If I, for instance, became 12 and booted up GTA 5, I would be able to do at least a dozen unfun activities. Doom's design is focused harder than the average Persona fan on his local playground. Man, I don't know what Persona is, but their fans sound weird. Also, seen a lot of anime girls, as I've learned in other videos, uh, the, the characters I identify as anime girls, uh, may not be necessarily anime girls. They may just be uh, people in maid outfits for some reason. A anime is weird, guys. I watched Cowboy Bebop, I finished the series, and you know what I said? I said, well, this was the pinnacle of anime, it only goes downhill from here, I think I'll see myself out. And I've never watched another anime since. And that is special. You will play the game in the way that is fun, or you will lose. So as good as 2016 was, a Polygon journalist could beat the first half, and that's unacceptable. Because yes, it is actually unfun to play games after having a lobotomy. In other games, I get to choose between things like stealth, vehicles, or outright combat. Yet Doom Eternal asks the question, why not force you to use every mechanic all the time without stopping? In a world where AAA studios try to pander to everyone, it's refreshing to have a game that sets out to do one thing the best and actually have developers who give a shit about linear design and gameplay. And the main component of that gameplay is the arsenal, because John- Yeah, okay, I- he makes a really good point here, and the military is actually really guilty of this as well. I call it over-engineering things, and this is what happens when you have- well, when you're selling products, unfortunately. Way military technology adoption gen generally tends to go is one of two ways. The first way is the military comes up with a gee whiz idea. They say, hey, we should have a satellite radio that can also uh, tell your position by looking at the stars. Maybe not the most useful thing in the world, but okay. So then they put out a bid and they say, we want to see, give us the best, cheapest satellite radio that does these things. And sometimes they will get, actually they tend to get decent, okay results. But sometimes you get these generals that will have not just one or two features, but they will want to see 15, right? And remember, as we talked about in other videos, when you're a military general, your qualifications are knowing small unit tactics. That's what got you into the position to decide what is and isn't possible in military technology. And so the F-35 is a classic example of this sort of terrible thinking. The military said, we want one fighter jet. We want it to fulfill basically every aviation role in the entire military doctrine, from vertical takeoff and landing, to deep strike fighter, to air-to-air -air combat, to stealth uh, a target infiltration. They wanted a fighter jet that does everything, and they want it to have integrated electronic systems they want it to be uh stealth and radar uh invisible they wanted it to do everything the list of requirements was thousands of pages long the result is that you have something which has tried to cram all these different requirements all these different technological designs into a single airframe and it is complete and utter nonsense it barely works because the systems are so finely tuned that the rigors of even routine flight seem to create problems one after the other. Recent video has emerged showing that the F-35, again the newest fighter jet with the highly sophisticated and ultra expensive stealth coating, appears to be rusting when exposed to the water of the sea. That's of course, for those of you that know, what aircraft carriers sail on. So it's a kind of a problem for 
the F-35, but when I was in the military, that was true of every piece of gear. I actually would get, several times, would receive million dollar pieces of equipment that had features that were completely esoteric to me. Surely someone knew how to use them, maybe the person that designed them, but what we got is just a very ineffective version of the thing's core mission. Again, we got a satellite radio that had 15 other G-Wiz features, but no one ever told us how to use them, and so it just made it a really complex and finicky satellite radio. So when games do this and they try to make a game that has an element for every single person, right, the game designed by committee, you end up with a mediocre experience that isn't as tailored as one that doesn't try to do more than it is. I think a lot of indie games are like this. I think they occupy that niche where they sit there and go, we're not even going to try to be graphically good. I just want to tell a cool story that pulls people in. Uh, like uh, Firewatch is a good example of that. Right? Is that what it's called? Firewatch? Uh, or you get games like we talked about with Star Sector, where someone was just like, we don't even want to have a third dimension. We just want a very, uh, an economy manager and a uh, logistics manager for your starship fleet. And it works really well, but it's because they don't try to be 50 things. They don't have a thousand pages of requirement. They try to be one or two games, one or two things really, really well. Dawn Doom uses every weapon throughout the game. The first shotgun is used in the last level, and the last level is used by the first shotgun. When you get an upgrade, it isn't a replacement. It's a genuine addition to your arsenal. Every one of them has specific uses, and yet these don't interfere at all. They enhance. How do I kill an enemy? Well, shoot his hands off. Fire a rocket. Fire a ballista. Fire flames. Freeze him. Fire fire on his freeze and fro shotgun. Shotgun. Brain aneurysm. Just as important as how you kill is how you heal and how you restore. Fortunately, the the aggression of this game rivals my dog in a kindergarten. Like Whoa! Yikes. That's that pitbull stereotype. I know, pitbull people swear they're such peaceful dogs, but, you know, chihuahuas are also pretty aggressive dogs, but guess what? A small child could easily, easily defend themselves from a chihuahua. Most, adult me most adults cannot defend themselves from a pitbull real life the only way to get ahead of the competition is to kill them how do i heal when low kill them how do i get ammo back kill them with a chainsaw in addition most weapons in the game have two mods which completely change their behavior such stunning examples would be the microwave beam the automatic shotgun and the fucking destroyer blade god that shit's cool but on top of eight weapons 12 mods and a declining mental state we keep going more than any define declining one weapon this is actually one of the things that i think is a good point to point out is that one of the things that's really weird about, I'm not even going to call it PTSD, right? But about just sort of combat experience generally is one, a lot of people have these switches that kind of flip back and forth when they are in combat. So when I was deployed, right, things blowing up around me, right, hearing explosions or hearing gunshots was kind of a routine event. And it didn't really disturb you or produce a stress reaction you would just sort of hear the alarm go off and you sort of wander to a bunker or of course you would just hear something blow up and you'd be like great we're gonna have to deal with this in, in an hour and but when you're home and i'll tell you this from personal experience things like fireworks really bother me and i don't know if it's because i need to have body armor and a rifle and to be surrounded by other soldiers to feel safe when things are exploding or if there is some sort of switch that flips between oh this is fine because i'm in an environment where this is supposed to happen and then you have a stress reaction when you're in an environment where things aren't supposed to blow up but they do it's tough to say but there is definitely something to be said for not saying that, oh, in response to a stress that your mental state is declining. Sounds like John Doom's mental state is fine because it's making him more effective at killing demons. You'll be using your suit abilities, and they all have individual buttons. This is in addition to the eight that you use for weapons. These would be things like zoom for fast, grenade for death, Swedish grenade for life, punch for no reason, and a flamethrower for armor. I play Invoker in Dota 2, and this shit makes me play my keyboard like it's a fucking Moonlight Sonata. I thoroughly recommend playing PC and never using the weapon wheel for maximal Ritalin output. And if you can't switch weapons fast or play on easy mode,
That's fine, man. We're all busy. How about I give you two more buttons? You thought I was done. There's two ways to kill a demon in Doom Eternal. The fun way or the funny way. And to maximize the funniness level, we have the Crucible, which is a direct, instantaneous kill on every enemy. Giant area boss, dead. Previous area boss, dead. The final boss, fuck him. Now I hear you thinking, Josh, that sounds pretty strong. Oh boy, buckle your ass. Because the second super weapon on my extensive list of two things is the BFG, which can... Oh, man, the BFG was also featured in the original Doom. It stood for exactly what you think it stands for, and is just another reminder that the designers of the original Doom were mostly trolling. Canonically stands for big fucking gun. Also canonically, it fires a hole directly into the core of Mars. You can't just shoot a hole into the surface of Mars. I love it. I love how there's some nerd who's like, you can't do that, and then you do it anyway. Which, of course, is a trope in every action movie game. Doom Eternal just doesn't pretend like it's not ridiculous. Now, I could kill an enemy the long way, or I could kill him and his dog faster than the ATF at Waco. It clears out everything. Okay, it, all right, let's give a little context for the ATF at Waco. The ATF, all right, the siege at Waco was complicated. So what happened is there was this religious cult. They were a cult, right? But they were probably harmless, right? They were just eccentric, surrounded this guy named David Koresh, and they were just sort of doing their thing, waiting for the apocalypse. Now, they may have stockpiled some weapons, but... It's not a crime in the United States to stockpile most kinds of weapons. And the ATF, though, who, again, at this time was only an organization that had been in existence about 20 years, uh, decided that they really needed to take down this David Koresh guy. And so what they did is, of course, they... Uh, Basic, they were able to get some weapons charges against him, right? Uh, that they were pretty sure he was manufacturing. I want to say it was a, manufacturing a destructive device, like converting weapons into grenades. Like they thought maybe he had bought a bunch of like gunpowder. It, it, it's not clear. It's not 100% clear. But they, had, they were reasonably certain this guy and his cult manufactured a destructive device. And so reasonably, they surrounded the compound um, and then called in like National Guard helicopters, armored personnel carriers, and besieged this compound. And of course, then David Koresh was like, no, I'm not coming out. And it became this longstanding siege. The Branch Davidians, the name of the cult, many of their women and children uh, went down into a basement safe house. But when the ATF decided they were going to try to raid the house, the occupants shot back at the um, entry team. And then they were like, all right, we are going to use... This is controversial. Supposedly, they only wanted to use a smoke grenade um, inserted into the compound via a tank. And that the Branch Davidians themselves may have set off a flammable explosives in order to burn themselves down and not be taken alive maybe the uh, tear gas or flashbang may have ignited something in the building or the other rumors that the atf deliberately burned down the compound trapping everyone inside but either way it was at the time a tremendous show of force by u.s law enforcement again to see tanks and military helicopters deployed on u.s soil by law enforcement against what looked like a, a group of about 30 hippie yahoos living out in the desert just sort of being mildly annoying seemed like a, a real case study in government overreach the irony of course is that you can actually see in some of the hearings a lot of today's senators who now advocate against for a lot of federal investigations and a strong law enforcement backing you can see them absolutely pillory some of this law enforcement action just proof that for a lot of politicians whatever is popular 
for their particular political party, they will change their tune in a heartbeat. Thing you can see instantly. I am so thankful the game limits how many times you can do this. Now, I understand that at first this may seem complicated, but that just isn't true because the entire game is effectively a tutorial for hard mode. And because you're always learning as you play, it never feels stale. Doom even lets you choose what stats and runes to upgrade. I spec entirely into mobility and ammo, making my character a flimsy, crack-addled spider monkey. As a side note, we should release dozens or possibly hundreds of macaques into New York City. They can survive there. Why does Thailand and get to keep all of the good monkeys. So what more is there to learn about Doom Eternal? Well, have you ever given thought to the various unwashed baboons that I'm fighting? The answer may shock you. Those are the... As you may have guessed, there are at least three, perhaps four demons in the game, which is a lot for someone who is a small, blonde anime lolly such as myself. But it's the... I have many questions. He is both John Doom and also his anime waifu. Guys, th you need a brain the size of this guy to understand what the hell Maxer's talking about. Variety of the demons that make the game interesting. Demons can fly, they can roll around like hedgehogs, contract obesity, and be bastards. Who is Sandy Loam? I, I don't think that you can contract obesity. I think contract usually implies that it's a disease that you've gotten from something you can contract mesothelioma through exposure to asbestos you can contract the flu from exposure to your neighbor's filthy kids but you cannot contract obesity you can just become obese who is Sushima? Amy Rose? I didn't know she could stand. The point of the entire game, therefore, is to balance targets, switch weapons, and scream internally as you repeatedly fail to be cool. Just like high school. What I'm getting at is every demon has completely different behavior and goals from one another. The Doom Hunter rolls around in a comically small tank. The zombies, like us, exist to die. And the Marauder produces controversy. He does a lot of damage, blocks your attacks, fights you at wild speeds, and can only be attacked after blatantly signaling so. I personally have no issue with him as I find the challenge fun and engaging. And if you don't, I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm saying you're bad. I'm not getting into the details for each one since that's not funny, but don't worry, there are 27 of them without DLC. And if you're wondering why I'm fighting the entire cast of Dante's Inferno, you're actually the minority. This game tries at every moment to make exposition collectible. Why is there just a, a fucking big spear in the planet and <laughs> why is heaven comprised entirely of moth people? I mean... We've discussed this in other videos, man. If there were a, a, a race of beings powerful enough, they would look to us like gods. In fact, we can be pretty certain that sometimes even, for example, when the Spanish conquistadors arrived and encountered the Aztecs, they were mistaken for gods, and all they had was armor, a commitment to not showering, and some gunpowder rifles. You cannot stop the procession. <laughs> It feels like one guy wrote the events of the game, and another guy invented LSD just to write the backstory. So I'm going to combine both of them into a single, accurate interpretation of the Doom lore. If I say something objectionable, just pretend that it's right. I mean, I just assume... Well, Maxer tells us right in the, right, right in the title. It's incorrect. So, th th there you go. It's like wrong answers only on a test, man. You, you almost can't do badly. One Brazilian years ago, there was a guy named The Dad, who was effectively God, and he made moths in Lamp Heaven called The Makers. Every 10,000 years, all moths combine their collective consciousness into one giga moth called The Con Maker, who is the Moth Pope. So the moths rule over the galaxy, sort of, until Earth happens, and then we start fucking everything up. The Moth Pope finds John Doom after a spree of murders, and he explains to her that yes, hell exists. It's weird that humans knew about hell before God. Anyways, the Moth Pope, after finding out that hell is real, very reasonably decides to sacrifice a planet to it. See, it turns out that God literally pieced the fuck out like 10 million years ago and let the moth do whatever they wanted. So now the con maker cannot be replaced and cannot die. So she sort of goes insane from the constant immortality. Now the plan is to- Yep, uh, that's always a question. What would it be like to be that old? To see civilizations rise and fall the way you and I see your trash get taken out. Would you be insane or would you realize you were the only sane person? These are the sort of questions that you have to wrestle with. I think if, if one thing that we have seen is that human beings tend to 
their brains tend to get a little wonky the longer they spend in isolation the more time you the, the more time you spend by yourself say talking to a computer screen for views the less time and the less time you spend around other human beings the more likely you are to start to go a little bananas and that can show up in all kinds of weird ways I believe there's not a ton of evidence for this because there hasn't been many studies done. I think that's a big driver of conspiratorial or conspiracy-like thinking. Um, whenever anyone engages and purports that there is a large group of, of enemies who are working in concert to uh, thwart the forces of good, um, usually those sort of narratives, right, they only appear in Harry Potter for a reason. The real world's a little more complicated and a little less black and white, but conspiracy theorists tend to love them. And if you spend enough time alone with no one to sort of moderate your thinking, uh, your brain tends to go to those places. And in larger times, right, one of the reasons that people in nursing homes, especially dementia sufferers, tend to do so much worse is because they're isolated. And the isolation actually can be shown, this is scientifically proven, to decline cognitive ability. So I imagine if you were tens of thousands of years old, it would probably feel the same as if you didn't really have anyone to talk to because everyone around you looks like an ant and lives about as long. To get some of that sweet hell energy by repeatedly sacrificing ah. entire planets to the Dark Lord in exchange for it. Meanwhile, a sentient robot named Samuel Hayden is very busy on Mars. Earth has this problem called climate change and we need to find a new energy source. So instead of something hard and difficult like solar power, Samuel Hayden is like, what if we extract this cool blue energy from hell? Also, it's on Mars. Earth does this until hell begins breaking into Mars and John Doom stops them. With this is actually more or less the plot of a Arthur C. Clarke novel in which someone, it, it almost is a climate change analog because someone figures out you can tap into, it's not hell, but it's a, a dimension of the universe, another dimension in which the universe is just still kicking off. So it's a big soup of tons of energy. So if you bleed out a little bit of that soup, you can extract a tremendous amount of energy. And it seems like a great idea until they realize that the other universe has slightly different laws of physics. And that is what the energy actually is, is the difference between their physics and ours. And then it turns out that our physics is starting to warp their physics is starting to warp our world. It's starting to make our world a little more like theirs, which of course would be bad because it would mean the entire universe would turn into the hot energy soup. So logically, in a very prescient move, everyone ignores this reality. Every single person doesn't want it to be true, so they pretend that it isn't. And the only way, the only way they can get anyone to make a change in favor of actually not using the universe destroying energy source is to basically find an even better energy source from a universe that has things in parallel. I.e., if one place is hot energy soup, they find cold energy ice world, and they use both energy in equal parts, meaning that everything is just objectively better. And Arthur C. Clarke's point is that getting people to make a hard choice on a social level is basically impossible, and your only way to do it is to give them an even better alternative than the existing one. It doesn't bode well for us which is the plot of Doom 2016. This makes Samuel Hayden mad because he's funded by the Koch brothers and really doesn't want to build a windmill. So instead of destroying the demonic crucible, he just brings it back to Earth and catapults John Doom into the backstory planet. If you think that sounds unreasonable, just remember that we considered blotting out the sun before building a fucking solar panel. I only poo-poo-farted for the good of you. Humanity. Unsurprisingly, demons invade to recycle Earth into blue energy for the Moth Pope, so John Doom has to fight both Catholics and Hell. And as you go through the game, you might notice that it just brings up random shit at will. Like, oh sorry, the Soul Factory is being held there by two gigantic titans, and it's like, okay, I guess Attack on Titan is real now. Doom's I mean, r real. Player, you'll need this knife to kill my son. Oh shit, what'd he do? He's the giant, uncontrollable deer titan. The plot of the main game, to understate it, is psychotic and acts as an increasing checklist of galactically convoluted tasks. Just in this one game, John Doom finds an ancient city like three times, goes to the North Pole to kill Santa, fights Croatia, does a little trolling, does a little cockfighting, invades heaven, and permanently kills God, but we'll get back to that. Doom 2016 took place on Mars, but this game has you slung around the 
the universe on a fucking bungee cord. So I understand completely when people say they don't play Doom Eternal for the plot. They're just wrong. I play Doom Eternal for the plot, and that might sound strange to you, but Eternal's plot is pure insanity, and it does everything that it needs to. We are painfully aware that the plot exists as a contrivance because the environmental designer went fucking ballistic. I just don't care. I played every single level, gleefully wondering, oh boy, what stupid shit is next? I cannot... I actually, so one of the things that's really interesting about creativity is that sometimes it thrives under constraint. This is true in a lot of situations, but let's look at something simple like a sonnet. A sonnet is actually an extremely rigid way of writing poetry. It, you have to get the accent of words in English aligned in just such a way. You have to add rhyming couplets at certain intervals. It's a very specific and constrained way of writing, which means that you have to find new, creative, different, and innovative ways of expressing your ideas if you want to communicate them in a sonnet instead of, say, a dumb rhyme. Another great example of this sort of constraint leading to creativity is our friends, the Soviets in World War II, who were subject to tremendous shortages in men and material, and so as a result, they designed these very material, materially efficient, easily manufactured, very, very, very resilient weapons and gear. You can see, if you look at my old videos on this channel, I had a bunch of camping videos where I would take out oftentimes Soviet military equipment and use it as modern camping stuff, and boy is it awesome. There's a tent that's also a poncho that's also a ground cover that is somehow both waterproof and canvas. This is the sort of innovation that you do when you're tight on resources, tight on time, and don't necessarily have the brightest uh, people that are going to be using it, like conscripts. So when you talk about Doom Eternal, maybe it was designed by the level and game designers first, and then it was up to someone to come up with a plot that let them string the levels together. But the result is a plot that's like pretty crazy and fun and out there fucking wait. So, play the game for the plot. It is integral to the experience of Doom Eternal. Oh, but Max, or there's a plot hole. How did the Doom Slayer get the first- Everything I've said so far, except some of it, applies in full partially to the base game. But there's 40 dollar dues of DLC where the gameplay is faster, the challenge harder, and the plot somehow even fucking worse in all the right departments. 2016 was a wash. Eternal is Usain Bolt, and the Ancient Gods is fucking Venezuelan inflation. You thought it was- these are three things I did not think could be reasonably in competition with one another. It was over when John Doom beat the demons and destroyed all of heaven, but you were wrong. That's just the beginning. And with both parts of the DLC now fully out, my recommendation cannot be understated. Let's get into why, and more importantly, what- Nah, there's always ancient gods. ...section of the video is going to be different, far more structural, and aligned with the plot of the DLC. Because the- I don't believe any of that for one second. The gameplay isn't what's new about the product, it's the challenge and the story. I originally wrote an entire script for this and then trashed it because it doesn't truly communicate how this DLC drove me to insanity and I hard cope by simping for 2D women. I will tell you if there's a very big gameplay change, but the point of the DLC- What is the difference between a hard cope and a soft cope? is more of what's amazing. If you like Doom Eternal, you will like the D- Is a hard cope like you totally focus on something else to save your brain from having to think about the thing you can't cope with, whereas a soft cope is using justification, rationalization, and uh, poorly constructed arguments to try to deal with the reality? DLC, period. Okay, so Samuel Hayden, you might know him for his various appearances on political YouTube debates advocating for carbon positivity. It turns out that he's not a robot, he's a fucking angel. Also, John Doom's Alexa is God. That's not a joke or exaggeration. His name is Vega, and he's the physical remnant of God's consciousness in AI form. So Samuel, now a fucking divine being, wants you to revive him since both God and Satan are trapped in volleyballs. At this point, the video can't count as spoilers because it makes no fucking sense. The first DLC is essentially trolling because you kill God. Why? Well, obviously to revive Satan, exclusively so you can fight him. What could go wrong? Of particular- <laughs> I mean, I- I guess you can revive him just to fight him. This is this is like some Goku level stuff here. Is this just true? Like if you're a certain level, a certain level of power as a fictional character that at some point you just run out of reasonable challenges and you just start resurrecting and searching people to fight. 
And also, why hasn't Superman started doing this? Their note here on the gameplay side is the final boss, who is Samuel Hayden. Because holy shit, this fight is hard. Also, the premise is ridiculous, and my enjoyment of the game is hurt by neither. Every aspect of this is speedy, fun, and everything else I've already said about the game in general. And when you finally beat Samuel and revive the Dark Lord, it turns out he's you. Yeah. The only thing in the world that could possibly kill John Doom. Himself. No blood can be sealed in this holy blood. <laughs> so now the not you you decides to go to hell where we all belong, and the second DLC is just chasing him. This is, of course, where the testosterone moves into critical levels. How does one? I just love how they have Ronnie Coleman there doing doing bench press. Poor dude. He 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 just loved doing heavy lifts, and he just got. Well, he tore himself apart. Get to the capital city of hell. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> it's Cleveland. Come on, guys. We all know it's Detroit. First of all, go to the planet of Argentinur, like the bats. No, actually, it's probably like Redding. Signal. Learn how to train your dragon, okay? Go into the giant spear that pierces the entire planet for some reason. Get the key to the Gate of Divum. Now go back to Earth, traverse The Last of Us 2, and find the Gate of Divum. But before I get to the final showdown with Crash Bandicoot Twin Sanity, there's some cool gameplay I want to talk about. You have a fucking hammer in this DLC. Primarily used to defy the laws of gravity, but secondarily gives you everything in the game. Health? No problem. Ammo? Absolutely. My deepest, darkest urges? Yes. As I... <laughs> Max uh, affinity for anime girls is actually starting to make me uncomfortable, and we're we're only 13 minutes in. Use this, I became more obsessed with hammers than Bob the fucking builder. And there's plenty of demons. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a demon. To use it on, since the DLC adds a shitload of reskins. For instance, the spirit is a congealed amphetamine mass that makes every infested target three times faster. Microsoft Pinball, who is fun to fight, I promise. And the Blood Makers. They are my original OC. Do not steal it. So now that we've reached. <laughs> original OC. Love it. Cleveland, it's time for the DLC to gain style. This is the culmination of all of our work. The final battle against Satan himself. And holy shit, you can feel it. When the Sentinel army shows up and everyone's ready to kick ass, you just can't help but feel like your dick is being tickled. Cleveland lives up to the hype too, for once, because it's a non-stop battle of epic proportions right up until the final boss. This is a universe which implicitly acknowledges your godlike power by making the only credible threat to you your identical twin with red eyes in a gun nook. That is called fucking gameplay. And it's a beautiful send-off right up until the man himself who awkwardly waddles around the arena like a penguin, but that's fine, the fight is still cool. Wow, you know, it's so sad that Steve Jobs died of Ligma. Who the hell is Steve Jobs? Ligma balls. <laughs> Got him! <laughs> now, be- <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I gotta say, there's nothing quite like finishing off an opponent with a, with a witty quip. I'm just kidding, I've never done that. Anyone that does that is a cringe lord. Before we defenestrate, there's a few details I want to talk- Defenestrate is actually the correct word for pushing someone out a window. Talk about that truly complete this game, make it a real 10 out of good. Firstly, I would classify the music of this game as metal without guitars, and I fucking dig it so much. How do you make metal without a guitar? Well, you sample Mongolian throat singing and your lawnmower. It just sounds so good. Normally, this is this is like its own genre of like doom wave or something. Music isn't very important, but it's so good that it becomes important. And the role it plays in setting your mood is vital. Also, the main composer Mick Gordon, like me, hey watches virtual YouTubers every waking second of his day. Great minds think alike. <laughs> I mean, okay, somebody in a podcast actually I listened to recently expressed an idea really well that, that I've sort of had for a while and that's intense people do intense things if you are someone who needs to make like crazy intense wild doom music right you have to just you have to just be an intense dude and maybe that means eight hours of vtubers just to make it through your day right to, maybe you need like to convert eight hours of vtuber energy and y you can distill that into like 30 seconds of doom music and so to do that you just have to like well convert a lot of you have to watch a lot of vtubers and maybe it's just a case of like you have to understand your audience who's like a, a weird 
just weird just weird and you have to understand all the facets of like modern society you know it's like it's like your version of the jack kerouac on the road uh journey through the heart of america but instead it's through the heart of twitch and you just sort of compress it into mongolian throat singing angry music and and the result is this the beautiful artwork right like like amy winehouse at the end just pained and beautiful and haunting and anyway it, let's move on in fact most of the music in this video is just doom eternal soundtrack guess you'll have to re-watch it over and over again to really listen i wonder if this is copyrighted Finally, this game looks really good. Not in a, oh wow, look at all these particles I'm stroking out way. It's more like, how does literally anyone have time to model all of the geometry in the game? It is unreal. It is so downright inspired that it makes you feel bad while playing it. Doom Eternal is such a fast and pulse pounding game. I mean, what I'm gonna say is like we talked about, if you choose to do linear gameplay right, it saves you so much rendering, there's no AI like programming enemies to spawn at certain rates. If you just get fixed guns, you don't have to program a random firearm generation. There's very little you need if you just have a story driven linear path. That it's like sprinting through the fucking Louvre. How am I supposed to appreciate the Mona Lisa when it looks like this? Should you buy the game? Yes, I am very biased. If speed and action is what you crave and you want to induce cardiac arrest early, this is your game. I would like to thank the. It's not early if it happened when it's right on time. Demonic Brotherhood funding this channel in exchange for their souls. If you would like to engage in blood sacrifice on my behalf, you can head to my Patreon to learn more. Thank you all for watching, and of course, run. They're coming. Well, wow. okay guys, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining. If you want to see me stream on Twitch, probably not Doom Eternal, probably some Escape from Tarkov, twitch.tv slash combat Paul is the combat vet Paul is the place to do it. Uh, other than that, gents, thanks for joining me on this. Comment down below if you want, have other gaming YouTubers you want me to check out. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.